The Tsar spent the last days of June and the first part of July in the hot and dusty little town of Simnitsa. He watched his engineers build a narrow pontoon bridge over the Danube and his men and supplies cross it in a steady stream. He read telegrams from his generals who had moved further into Bulgaria, met with his ministers and advisers, and visited troops on both sides of the Danube. The British government feared Russian designs on Constantinople and the vital straits. The Bosporus and Dardanelles leading from the Black Sea into the Mediterranean. Two months earlier, Disraeli had threatened to go to war if Constantinople or the Straits were endangered. Having witnessed continued Russian expansion in Central Asia, in spite of earlier promises, Disraeli and Queen Victoria were wary of Alexander's new assurances regarding Constantinople. By January 1878, Russian troops were in Adrianople, and it looked as though they might soon be in Constantinople. By this time, Alexander was back in St. Petersburg, having returned in December to a tumultuous reception of ringing church bells, booming cannons, and shouting crowds. The day after the capture of Adrianople, the Tsar's brother, Nicholas, wrote to Alexander that it was necessary to take Constantinople, but fear of English and Austro-Hungarian intervention restrained the Tsar. He ordered his brother to advance without attempting to take either Constantinople or Gallipoli, which overlooked the crucial Dardanelles. On January 30th, 1878, the Turks accepted Russian conditions for peace negotiations, and the following day an armistice was signed. The Russians were to halt at a line which, at its nearest point, was only some 35 miles away from Constantinople. Alexander sent Ignatiev to Adrianople to negotiate a treaty. Ignatiev and the extreme nationalists in Russia had wanted Russia to continue advancing towards Constantinople. But others, like Foreign Minister Gorchakov, always mindful of British and Austrian fears, advised caution. Indeed, Disraeli and Queen Victoria both were determined to resist what they considered excessive demands on Turkey. Even after the armistice, they continued to fear a Russian advance on Constantinople. In the middle of February, British ships entered the Dardanelles and advanced to within a few miles of Constantinople. Russia countered by demanding and obtaining Turkish acquiescence in the occupation of the little village of San Stefano, located on the Sea of Marmara, only about six miles from the walls of the capital. It was in this picturesque site that the Russians and Turks finally signed a peace treaty in early March to create a large autonomous Bulgaria with a large Aegean coastline, providing for Russian territorial gains in the Caucasus and a Turkish indemnity to Russia, stipulated some territorial gains for Serbia and Montenegro, recognized the full independence of Serbia, Montenegro, and Romania, and mandated Turkish reforms in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Russian nationalists and pan-Slavists were in general happy with the Treaty of San Stefano. Some thought, however, that it was the very minimum that Russia could be expected to accept. But Alexander was worried, and with good reason. He feared that London and Vienna would find the treaty unacceptable, and for a variety of reasons, not the least of which was the already strained national budget, Alexander did not want a war with these two European powers. Consequently, he succumbed to Austrian and British diplomatic pressure and agreed to some modifications. After months of complex negotiations, the concerned powers agreed to meet in Berlin in an attempt to finalize a mutually acceptable post-war settlement. The Congress of Berlin opened in the middle of June 1878 and lasted for a month. The final treaty was a grave disappointment to many Russians. Although territorial gains and indemnity expanded rights for the Slavic Christian peoples of the Balkans and a weakening of the Ottoman Turkish Empire were real accomplishments, Russian nationalists were bitterly disappointed with some of Alexander's compromises. Nevertheless, a major reward of Russian victory 
was the independence of Bulgaria from Turkey. Bulgaria still honors Alexander II among its founding fathers with a statue in the heart of its capital, Sofia. Bahá'u'lláh's tablet to Alexander II was revealed in Akka around 1868-69. It begins by proclaiming the sublime nature of his divine station and warns the Tsar not to turn away from the face of his Lord. O Tsar of Russia, incline thine ear unto the voice of God, the King, the Holy. Beware, lest thy desire deter thee from turning towards the face of thy Lord the compassionate, the most merciful. In the next passage, Baha'u'llah implicitly reveals his inscrutable power to read men's thoughts and to respond to their sincere prayers. Addressing the Tsar, Baha'u'llah makes this amazing statement. We verily have heard the thing for which thou didst supplicate thy Lord while secretly communing with him. Wherefore, the breeze of my loving kindness wafted forth, and the sea of my mercy surged, and we answered thee in truth. Thy Lord verily is the all knowing, the all wise. A remarkable story has been recorded concerning this astonishing passage. Akka Muhammad Rahim, a native of Isfahan, was an accomplished teacher of the faith who visited Akka twice during the lifetime of Baha'u'llah. Before going on his first pilgrimage there, he was introduced to the Russian consul in Esterabad, who had inquired about the faith. During one of their discussions, the consul indicated that he was interested in learning the meaning of the passage in Baha'u'llah's tablet to the Tsar, which states that Baha'u'llah had answered a prayer of the Tsar. The consul wanted to know what the Tsar had asked in his prayer, which was granted to him. Akka Muhammad Rahim didn't know at first what to answer, but meditating for a while on the subject, he came to the conclusion that Tsar Alexander II would no doubt have prayed for God's help in times of great peril, as was certainly the case during the defeats endured in the Crimean War. At such times, he thought the Tsar would have prayed to God to make him victorious in his fight against the Ottomans and to reverse the defeats he had suffered. Akka Muhammad Rahim conveyed these thoughts to the Russian consul and suggested that he ought to write a letter to the Tsar and inform him that his prayers would be answered and that he should carry out his plans and intentions. After these meetings, Akka Muhammad Rahim was apprehensive that his interpretation of the tablet might have been incorrect. When he finally traveled to Akka and arrived at the caravansary, Mirza Akayan, Baha'u'llah's amanuensis, came to see him. Among other things, he asked about the sessions with the Russian consul in Esterabad and about what was discussed. But Akka Muhammad Rahim was apprehensive and did not mention the exchange they had had about the tablet to the Tsar. The following morning, Abdul Baha, the eldest son of Baha'u'llah, known as the Most Great Branch, visited Akka Muhammad Rahim, who felt obliged to tell him the whole story exactly as it had happened, and confessed that he might have made a mistake in his answer to the consul's question about the meaning of the tablet. To his relief, Abdul Baha told him that the statement he made was the truth. Abdul Baha explained that on a certain day, Baha'u'llah intimated that at that very moment someone was reading the tablet of the Tsar. He said, The Russian consul asked one of our servants what was the prayer of the king. The answer he received was correct. Then Baha'u'llah said, That person was Akka Muhammad Rahim i Isfahani. Several days after the fall of Sevastopol in September 1855, 
Alexander II, his mother, wife, and four sons were on a train from St. Petersburg to Moscow. From there, the Tsar would go south to encourage his troops in the Crimea. On the day after his arrival in Moscow, Alexander went to several of the Kremlin churches, including the Cathedral of the Assumption, to ask for God's help in Russia's hour of need. With the benefit of hindsight, it could now be said that the prayers uttered by the Tsar in that time of defeat and great despair in 1855 were answered in the Russo-Turkish War of 1877-78. The Tsar went to war, among other things, to avenge the defeat of his father, Nicholas I, and was to some degree successful in reducing the territory and power of the Ottoman Empire. It should be noted here that in the Sura Irais, the tablet addressed to Ali Pasha, then Prime Minister of the Sultan, revealed when Baha'u'llah was on his way to the prison of Akka in 1868, he had foretold the calamities which were to befall the Turkish government as a punishment from God for the cruelties they had inflicted on him and on his family and disciples. And later, in the Kitabi Akdas, the Most Holy Book, written in 1873, he made a further denunciation of the tyrannical regime in Turkey and prophesied its downfall. The mysterious and untimely death of Sultan Abdulaziz in 1876, at the age of 45, was the initial punishment, followed by the Russo-Turkish War of 1877-78, which brought victory to the Russians and set in motion the process of the disintegration of the Ottoman Empire. Adrian Opel, once the proud residence of the Ottoman sultans, and later the place where Baha'u'llah was exiled by edict of Sultan Abdulaziz, and from whence he wrote his powerful summons to the autocratic rulers of his time, was occupied by the Russians in 1878, and no less than 11 million people were freed from the cruelties of Ottoman rule. Returning to the tablet addressed to Tsar Alexander II, Bahá'u'lláh makes mention of the role played by Prince Dolgorukov, Russian minister of the Tsar, to the court of Naziridin Shah in gaining Bahá'u'lláh's release from the Siyad Shah in 1852, and notes that because of this act, the Tsar has attained a special station in the eyes of God. But in the next sentence, Bahá'u'lláh warns him not to barter it away by subsequent actions. Whilst I lay chained and fettered in the prison, one of thy ministers extended me his aid. Wherefore hath God ordained for thee a station which the knowledge of none can comprehend, except his knowledge? Beware, lest thou barter away this sublime station. Thy Lord verily doeth what he willeth. What he pleaseth will God abrogate or confirm, and with him is the knowledge of all things in a guarded tablet. The unavoidable yet misunderstood and ignored message in this and all the other tablets to the sovereigns of the period, addressed either collectively or individually, was the imperative to acknowledge the manifestation of God in his new temple. The prisoner of Akka calls upon the Tsar of the Russian Empire to summon the nations to God. Arise thou amongst men in the name of this all-compelling cause, and summon then the nations unto God, the exalted, the great. Be thou not of them who called upon God by one of his names, but who, when he who is the object of all names appeared, denied him and turned aside from him, and in the end pronounced sentence against him with manifest injustice. Blessed be the king whom the veils of glory have not deterred from turning unto the day-spring of beauty, and who hath forsaken his all in his desire to obtain the things of God. He indeed is accounted in the sight of God as the most excellent of men, and is extolled by the inmates of paradise, and them that circle, mourn, and eve round the throne on high. The exhortations of Baha'u'llah fell on deaf ears. Unmoved by the proclamation of so mighty a message, Tsar Alexander II continued to rule over his country 
albeit with waning authority and control, until March 13, 1881, when he was assassinated. And with the rise of Bolshevism in 1917, his dynasty was extinguished. Alexandrina Victoria, the only child of Edward, Duke of Kent, and Victoria Maria Luisa of Saxe Coburg, was born on the 24th of May, 1819, one year and seven months after Baha'u'llah was born. The Duke and Duchess of Kent selected the name Victoria, but her uncle, George IV, insisted that she be named Alexandrina after her godfather, Tsar Alexander II of Russia. Victoria's father died when she was eight months old. On the death of George IV in 1830, his brother, William IV, became king. William had no surviving legitimate children, and so Victoria became his heir. Upon his death in 1837, Victoria became queen. Barely 18, she refused any further influence from her domineering mother and ruled in her own stead. Popular respect for the crown was at a low point at her coronation, but the modest and straightforward young queen won the hearts of her subjects. She wished to be informed of political matters, although she had no direct input in policy decisions. Queen Victoria's cousin, Prince Albert of saxe coburg visited London in 1839. Victoria immediately fell in love with Albert, and although he initially had doubts about the relationship, the couple were eventually married in February 1840. During the next 18 years, Queen Victoria gave birth to nine children. In the early part of her reign, she was influenced by two men, her first prime minister, Lord Melbourne, and her husband, Prince Albert. Both men taught her much about how to be a ruler in a constitutional monarchy, where the monarch had very few powers but could exert much influence. Victoria was deeply attached to her husband, and she sank into depression after he died of typhoid fever in 1861 at the age of 42. She had lost a devoted husband and her principal trusted advisor in affairs of state. She continued to carry out her official duties, but withdrew from public view, spending most of her time in the Scottish Highlands at her home at Balmoral Castle. With time, the private urgings of her family and the flattering attention of Benjamin Disraeli, Prime Minister in 1868, the Queen gradually resumed her public duties. The Queen's influence during the middle years of her reign was generally used to support peace and reconciliation. On the Eastern question, in the 1870s, Victoria believed that Britain, while pressing for necessary reforms, ought to uphold Turkish hegemony as a bulwark of stability against Russia, Victoria's popularity grew with the increasing imperial sentiment from the 1870s onward. After the Indian Mutiny of 1857, the government of India was transferred from the East India Company to the Crown, with the position of Governor General upgraded to Viceroy. And in 1877, Victoria became Empress of India under the Royal Titles Act passed by Disraeli's government. During Victoria's long reign, direct political power moved away from the sovereign. A series of acts broadened the social and economic base of the electorate. These acts included the Second Reform Act of 1867, the introduction of the secret ballot in 1872, which made it impossible to pressure or intimidate voters, and the Representation of the People's Act of 1884, in which the right to vote was extended. Despite this decline in the sovereign's power, Victoria showed that a monarch who had a high level of prestige and who was prepared to master the details of political life could exert an important influence. It was during Victoria's reign that the modern idea of the constitutional monarch, whose role was to remain above political parties, began to evolve. She was a very strong supporter of empire. In her later years, 
she almost became the symbol of the British Empire. At her death, it was said, she ruled over an empire on which the sun never set. Queen Victoria died at Osborne House on the Isle of Wight on the 22nd of January, 1901, after a reign which lasted almost 64 years, the longest in British history. She was buried at Windsor beside Prince Albert in the Frogmore Royal Mausoleum, which she had built for her final resting place. Above the mausoleum door are inscribed Victoria's words, Farewell, best beloved. Here at last I shall rest with thee. With thee in Christ I shall rise again. <laughs>